Welcome everyone, Adam LaFaccia, your moderator here, and thank you so much for joining us today for the Time and Navigation Conference. Today we'll be hearing from experts from the National Air and Space Museum who worked on the Time and Navigation exhibition there. But before we get started, we're just going to cover a few technical aspects of the online room with you, starting with the Q&A questions box on the left side of the screen. And you can use this box to enter in your comments and questions throughout the sessions today. If you have any technical questions, you can type them in there, and I'm happy to troubleshoot with you one-on-one -on -one to get those sorted out as quickly as possible. But please also feel free to enter any content-related questions or comments, and we'll do our best to address as many of those during the sessions today as we can. If for any reason you have a larger technical issue and you're not able to ask me for help in the room, feel free to email us at smithsonian at learningtimes.com for tech assistance. You'll also notice that we have closed captioning for the events today down at the bottom of the screen. We hope those are useful for you, but if they're distracting, feel free to click the drop-down arrow in the top right-hand corner of that box and change it to No Captions. We have several Smithsonian Quests and shareable Smithsonian Education badges, which you can learn more about on the link here on the screen. We'll also be hearing from Ashley Naranjo in a minute from the Smithsonian with some more details. But I'd like to also note that your conversation with us today is not just limited to the chat box, but we'd love if you could join us on Twitter using hashtag TimeNav. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Ashley now to talk a little bit more about the Smithsonian Quests. Good morning. Thanks so much, Adam. My name is Ashley Naranjo, and I work at the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access, which is a central education office here at the Smithsonian. And we collaborate with the Smithsonian's 19 museums, nine research centers, and the National Zoo. As you may have noticed when you were logging in, there's a schedule of upcoming programs as well as archived sessions. We're glad to have the team from the Time and Navigation exhibition with us from the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum today. We're also excited to announce that we've uploaded over 100 hours of archived online conferences onto Smithsonian Education's YouTube channel. Past themes have ranged from Abraham Lincoln to climate change, and as you can see, they all offer uh, an interdisciplinary approach to thematic topics. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, you'll note that we've created a number of Smithsonian Quest opportunities in conjunction with the topics of all of these sessions. These are digital badging opportunities and activities that students can complete before, after, or independent of the sessions. Our newest digital badge is the Navigator, which asks students to complete three related activities. The first is to think about the timeline of innovation in navigation and the needs that navigating in new frontiers brought about, namely by sea, through air, and in space. The students are also asked to think about major advances in technology and the Global Positioning System, or GPS. And finally, students are asked to think about who can navigate today and what challenges are ahead as we think about improving tools of navigation. So I hope you and your students will explore these uh, in the future. Uh, finally, I hope you enjoy this session and be sure to look out for additional resources that we'll provide in the chat, uh, including the Time and Navigation website, which is timeandnavigation.si.edu. Thanks so much. We're looking forward to a great day of learning and learning more about Time and Navigation. Wonderful. And thank you, Ashley. Here's a quick look at the conference schedule for today. We're kicking things off with the Time Place Connection at 11 o'clock. Then at 12 o'clock, we'll be back with you for Meeting the Challenge, Inventing the Future at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, How Does It Work? And at 2 p.m., Who Can Navigate? And just another note, all of these times are Eastern U.S. times, so make sure to check your appropriate time zone. And actually, we'll be talking a little bit more about time zones in just a moment. And I'll turn the floor over to Mike Lean, who's going to kick us off with our first session today. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Ashley. Um, good morning. My name is Michaeline Gimpaoli, and I'm just going to tell you just a little bit about myself. I'm an educator at the National Air and Space Museum, and I know sometimes students want to know how you get to, to where you are in, in your career, and I have an undergraduate degree in history and a degree in museum studies. And um, the reason why I'm here is I was a member of the team who developed the Time and Navigation exhibition that's currently on display at the National Air and Space Museum. 
And it takes a whole lot of people to develop an exhibit. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm an educator, and my role on the team was to think about how visitors, including teachers and students, will be using this exhibition both in the museum and in their classrooms. Following my presentation, you will hear lots from three of the curators who worked on this exhibition. They do a lot of work, but one of their jobs was to do a lot of in-depth research, including working with primary resources on topics that are covered in the exhibit. Today you will hear from Roger Connor, who will talk about how navigation has been shaped by national events. Paul Ceruzzi's talk will cover how various navigation and timing systems work. And Andrew Johnston will wrap up the conference by explaining how navigation has changed over time, how people navigate, and who is in charge. And I also should add that my friend Andy is also here today to help out with any technical questions you guys might have about my presentation. During my presentation, I will help you understand why time is essential to finding exact location, how and why time became standardized, and how finding precise time has allowed us to find our way anywhere in the world. If you cannot stay with us for all four presentations, as mentioned before, they will be archived on the Time and Navigation website as well as the Smithsonian Education Conference page. Before I begin, I'd like to take a minute for you to check the time. And Adam, if we can put that pull up. And if you can let me know what you looked at to tell the time. Looks like we have a lot of early responses coming in here, uh, leaning more towards computer, but we have uh, one phone checker. Well, it does absolutely make sense that people at an online conference would be checking their computer. Do I see any watches? No watches and no wall clocks. Well, obviously, today some of the most obvious places to look for time are uh, your computer or your phone. And that was easy, right? We're going to talk a little later about some of the tools for te how telling time have developed. But for now, I'm going to talk to you about how to find out where you are. One thing I did want to point out is I, it says it's a second setting watch from 1927. Obviously, one of the images is actually from my iPhone, which is how I tell the time. So where in the world are we? This information is a little bit more difficult to get than just telling the time. But if you use the internet, your phone, or GPS receiver, you can get coordinates of where you are. But what do I mean when I say coordinates? Coordinates are where you are located in the world in terms of latitude and longitude. Now, let me define latitude and longitude. Latitude. These are these imaginary lines that go around the Earth, circling the globe parallel to the equator, which is right here. The equator is a um, and it divides, the, and I'm, the equator is an imaginary line around the middle of the Earth that divides the globe into a top half and a bottom half, or north and south. Longitude are the imaginary lines circling the Earth through the now north and so south pole. The starting point is a line called the prime meridian, which I will show right here. The prime meridian is the line that divides the globe into east and west. Do you get latitude and longitude confused? I know I do. So here are some hints that help you remember. Remember that lat rhymes with flat, which is the same as horizontal. So latitude lines are the flat or horizontal lines on the map or on a globe. The word long is in longitude, and longitude is long from north to south. Or you can remember that longitude has an N, like north. I think my friend Andy here has a, a comment or a, something to add. Just a quick, quest, uh, a quick comment about the difference between latitude and longitude. Uh, you might notice, everyone, that the lines of latitude are all based on the Earth's equator, as, as, uh, as Michaeline just said. Uh, which is uh, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Whereas longitude lines, which are based on the prime meridian, that choice of prime meridian is somewhat arbitrary. You could actually choose a different line 
to be the origin point, and that's going to come up in the next few uh, uh, the next few steps that Michael Ian's going to talk about, because uh, it, it turns out that determining longitude is actually uh, complicated and related to time in ways that she will explain. Thanks, Andy, for that that clarification. Okay, so we're going to talk more about how time and place are related. If you know how fast something moves and you measure how much time it takes to get between two places, you can determine the distance between those places. And we can figure out position of places on the Earth by using things that move at consistent speeds, such as the rotation of the Earth or radio signals moving at the speed of light. So first we're going to talk a little bit more about the rotation of the Earth. The rotation of the Earth is a consistent speed and our first clock. For thousands of years, we observed that it takes Earth 24 hours to make one rotation. And because of this, our most basic way of keeping time is based on the Earth's relationship to the sun. Day to night, sunrise to sunset, light to dark, 24 hours, 365 days a year. So the rotation of the Earth is 360 degrees, or a full circle. Therefore, 15 degrees of movement is equal to one hour of time. Here is an example of a human tool that captures the Earth's timekeeping ability. Though remember, it is possible to know the time without a sundial. You just have to observe the sun, and when you observe that it's at its highest point in the sky, it is noon. And this particular sundial we're showing you is located in one of the Smithsonian gar gardens. And that makes the point that sundials are usually built for a particular latitude and longitude. And if you have a sundial, you know what time it is, but just in a single spot. If you want to know the time where you're standing, it works just fine. To navigate, it is important to know what the time is in more than one location. The marine chronometer, an early and very important invention, is a mechanical watch that could be used at sea, and it allowed sailors to know the time in two different places at once. With a chronometer, they could carry the time from where they were sailing from, and they could use a sextant and the sun, or stars, to figure out what time it was where they were located. Because time and longitude are equivalent, knowing the time in two places with certainty lets mariners determine their position. Remember, Back to that point of if you know how fast something moves and you measure how much time it takes to get between two places, you can determine the distance between those places. So let's go back to knowing that it's 12 noon because of the position of the sun. But that is noon only where you are. Unless you're standing right next to me, my noon by the sun is different than your noon by the sun. That is because noon is when the sun is as high in the sky as it's going to get at our line of longitude. So Washington, D.C. is way far east of San Francisco, but only a little bit west of New York. When telling time by the sun, it is very different time in San Francisco, and almost, but not quite the same time in New York. <laughs> but you might be thinking, isn't time on a clock just time on a clock? How could there be more than one time? The clock that you're looking at here says that it's Philadelphia Standard Time. How could Philadelphia have its own time? So now I'm going to go back to what time it is where you are. As you know, we have time zones. And we're going to ask you what time zone you're in. I'm in Washington, D.C., where it's Eastern Daylight Standings Time, Daylight Standings Time, Stand Daylight Savings Time, and I'm going to check my watch where it's about 11.15. And so where are you? And what is your time zone? And if you're not in one of the four U.S. time zones that we listed, please do let us know in chat. We'd love to hear what time and where you're joining us from. Oh, we have a really great question here before we go into um, talking about more about standard time. Why was Greenwich chosen? Now, actually, I'm going to turn that over to you, Andrew. It's actually a great time to answer that question before Michaeline talks about standard time. Uh, somebody wrote in and asked about uh, the, the prime meridian which runs through Greenwich, England, and why is that the prime meridian for the world? 
Well, you know, if we go back in time 300 years, there were many different prime meridians. Uh, each nation uh, could select their own prime meridian. Uh, one of the ones that was commonly used went through Paris. The United States had a prime meridian, which went through Washington, D.C. And many of the states in the, in the western U.S., you can see on the map on the screen right now, the borders of many of those states were actually surveyed, not relative to Greenwich, England, but relative to the prime meridian in, in Washington, D.C. But as you can imagine, if every different country had a different prime meridian for measuring zero degrees longitude, it might start to get confusing because you have ships crossing the oceans using different systems. Um, and so the nations of the world actually gathered in a conference that actually happened in D.C. and, and, uh, and decided uh, to, uh, to unify the systems. Uh, the best reason why Greenwich was chosen was because the majority of the charts used by ocean-going vessels uh, used uh, Greenwich as the prime meridian, uh, and that's just the heritage from the, from the British Navy actually going uh, all over the world. And isn't it true that Paris for a long time refused to admit that the prime meridian was not in not in France. Well, so the vote was taken of many different countries, and there were a couple of abstentions, and one of the abstentions was was France. Uh, nowadays, for better or worse, uh, we, the, all the nations of the world have agreed on the prime meridian there. That, so that zero degrees longitude that runs through the Greenwich Observatory, which is just outside of London. And I see another note popping in here, a question of when did this happen? A 1880s. 18, didn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong. It didn't it happen the year after this? We standardized time in yeah, the right. U.S. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you'll you'll be talking about it right now in in related to standard time because it's all very much related. That's right. But it was a very exciting time. But it's actually, I think, one of the things to the take away, away from this talk is that the standardization of time really did not happen all that long ago. So we're going to talk a little bit about the standard time zones. Um, before, the, before there were standardized time zones, each city and town across the continent could establish its own time. And the times were different not from each other, not just by hours, but by odd minutes and seconds. Because remember, when you're looking at the sun, as I mentioned before, it's going to be maybe five minutes different in the next town over. Imagine how difficult it must have been when railroads started to cross our country. How could they have reg regular schedules if every city had its own time? So in North America, it was the railroads that pushed for zone time, and they established standard railway time voluntarily on November 18, 1883. Each zone differed from the next by an hour of time. In the continental U.S., these time zones are Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. And I'm just doing the continental U.S. because it, it matches the map that's on my slide. And they're governed by meridians or line of longitude that start at zero degrees longitude at Greenwich, England, for the reasons why we just de described. In the early years of standard time, time could be shared over large areas by telegraph to keep the railroad synchronized. A person could also compare telegraph time to the sun's position to find their difference in longitude from the origin of the telegraph signal. And um, I think Andrew, Andrew wants to illuminate that point a little bit. Yeah, just, just to make clear how that works, if you have a, a, somebody keeping time in one city, they could transmit that time over a telegraph wire. So the telegraph signal could say, it's now 12 o'clock, it's now, it's now 1 o'clock, based on where the sun is in the sky where I'm sitting. Well, hundreds of miles away, somebody could be receiving that time, and they would notice, oh, the sun is in a slightly different position in the sky, and they could measure when, say, local noon is in their place, and, and based on that, they could determine how far away they are in longitude from where the, the telegraph signal came from. And Reginald in D.C. is wondering if it's true that Grand Central Terminal was the setting for standard time. Do you know? I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of a concrete connection between Grand Central Terminal and New York uh, and and uh, standard time. I th that is actually an interesting question. I don't know the answer. That's a, a fun trivia question. Yep. We'll go look that up after. <laughs> Absolutely. I do know, actually, um, just on a random note, for any of the, you folks out there that do National History Day, um, one of the na one of the winning National History Day projects was um, the j uh, the young man's name was Nathaniel Allen, and he was descended from one of the people who um, he who worked for the railroads who developed the standardized time. And he wrote a, a paper about his um, ancestor and won first place at the National History Day competition. So just keep the, this is a great topic for National History Day for any of you students out there. So by the 1950s, 
radio is um, radio signals moving at the speed of light were used all over the world to determine position by measuring fractions of a second required for signals to arrive from distant transmitting stations. And Andrew, is there anything you want to add to elaborate on the use of radio time? Sure. To explain how it would work with radio links, it worked just like with the um, with transmitting over telegraph wires. Although now, instead of transmitting it over wires that maybe ran along railroad routes, now what you're doing is you're transmitting the current time through radio signals. Uh, you see the picture there of the tall radio, uh, radio towers there just outside of DC. They could transmit the local time, or actually standard time in, in this case, um, to uh, almost anybody in the world, at least anybody in North America, so that somebody could actually receive that from a radio receiver. And then you could measure the difference between, say, the solar position where you're sitting and the time being transmitted by those tall towers. Uh, the transmitting clock that you see on the right there uh, is a mechanical timepiece, but it's more than just um, keeping time in a room, like a grandfather clock. It would actually be connected to an electrical mechanical uh, series of devices that would then transmit the time based on that through either a radio signal or wires so the people, for thousands of people, could actually receive that time over a very wide area. And now we're going to cover one last type of, the, of time, um, atomic time. Today, atomic clocks on satellites, um, and that is an atomic clock on the left. Doesn't look much like most clocks that you look at today. Um, they keep track of time and transmit data to po portable devices. Position is determined by measuring the time required for radio signals to arrive from space. For GPS to work, time must be known to within a billionth of a second. And we're going to talk a lot more about how GPS works in um, one of our other sessions, the one that by Paul Ceruzzi. But one thing you do need to know about this kind of time is the more precise you can measure time, the more precise you can determine your position. So this has been a very brief interview of the time place overview, excuse me, of the time place connection. Please join us for the next three sessions where you will learn about innovations that have made it possible for people to navigate get an inside look at how a navigation technology works and how the experience of navigation has changed for people all over the world. Yeah, if I might just uh, say a few things about the devices you see right there. Um, uh, Michael is totally right that the atomic clock you see on the left maybe looks more like a toaster than a clock. Um, the, the real breakthrough here uh, is that we have these timepieces that can measure those tiny billionths of a second. Um, you're going to hear more about this in the coming uh, presentations. You're going to hear the term nanoseconds. That's just a way of saying a billionth of a second. Um, and he, there are these atomic clocks that uh, keep time based on the, uh, the, the behavior of atoms, of, of in this case of atoms of the element cesium. You can actually measure billionths of a second of time. The reason that's important is remember what Michaeline said before. We're basing the measurement of time off things of known speed. Before, we were talking about using the Earth as a clock. The Earth goes around, it uh, rotates once every 24 hours. So we can use that as a clock. Well, it turns out for things like GPS to work, the Earth is not a precise enough clock. We need to use these cesium atoms where we're measuring billionths of a second because the Earth rotates once every 24 hours, but it varies a little bit. So each of those satellites, you see the picture in the middle there, shows uh, the uh, next generation of GPS satellite that's going to be in orbit. It carries these atomic clocks, and it transmits signals that move at a known speed. We know what the speed of light is, but some signals arrive on the ground. You see the picture on the right there of somebody holding a mobile device. Some signals will arrive just a split second before uh, from one, uh, the signals from one satellite arrive a split second before the signals from another satellite. And that device can measure that time offset and can determine its position because it knows where the satellites are located out there in space. You have to measure time down to just a few billionths of a second, as Michaeline said. And that allows you to, to determine where you're located on the Earth, and it's all based on the fact that we're keeping that time very precisely, and we know the speed of light, even though it moves very quickly. We can use it to find position. And oh, well, this actually leads to one of my very favorite facts that I learned in the exhibition, and, and Andrew can help explain it. But this um, GPS timing is are only really uh, relevant to us on Earth uh, for Einstein's equation. Can you elaborate on that? Right. So I think a lot of people have out there have heard about relativity. These are uh, Einstein's understandings of both space and time. Uh, and some people, you may get the idea that this is very esoteric. It doesn't really impact your, your life on an everyday life. Or in an everyday way, but it does with GPS. 
Here's why. Clocks tick at different rates depending on where they're located and how fast they're moving. This is an effect that can actually be measured. The faster something moves, the higher its relative velocity, the slower the clock will tick. If you're experiencing more gravity, the clock will also tick slower. What that means, if you look at the GPS satellite there, the clocks, the atomic clocks on board GPS satellites, first of all, their clocks tick faster because they're farther away from the Earth. They experience less gravity. But then again, their clocks tick slower because they're moving at higher relative velocity. The two factors partially cancel each other out, but not completely. An adjustment needs to be made every day. Actually, it's a, con it's a constant adjustment to the rate at which the clocks work. And if you don't take that into account, GPS does not work. If you don't take into account Einstein's relativity, GPS would not work at all. It's a minute-by-minute -minute confirmation that Einstein knew what he was talking about when he said E equals mc squared and the other things in terms of his understanding of, of both space and time. Thank you. So now I think this ends our official presentation, and now we're going to open the floor to questions. Wonderful. And I see an early question coming in here on the points that you just made, uh, wondering how do they adjust? How, if, how do they adjust the way the clocks work on GPS satellites? The people that operate the GPS satellites are actually out in Air Space in Colorado, uh, but the people that design them are, are a bigger uh, set of people. Uh, and they actually knew that this was going to be a factor before they launched the satellites. So what they did is they included that in the electronics uh, software that, that operates uh, the satellites. They did the math, and they knew what the offset would be. And so that's just part of the second-by-second uh, -second operations of how, how GPS works. I should also mention that it's, it's kind of interesting that they, the people that operate the system keep track of how the satellites are doing and how the clocks are doing on each on board each satellite so they keep track of which which atomic clocks are healthy which atomic clocks might might you know need a need a backup and so every day they're checking in on the health of the satellites to, to make sure that they continue to operate to uh, provide the services that all of us uh, take for granted still Here's a great question. Is there a fear of moving from analog to digital with time telling and navigation tools? What, what happens if GPS goes down? Really good point. Actually, if uh, Michael, Ian, since you're closer, could you go backwards on, on, the, uh, on, the, um, on the clocks? Yeah, look at a, a mechanical timepiece uh, right here. Uh, you know, some, some people are we're used to that time face, you know, that round in the big hand and the little hand. Uh, and we're often used to, to seeing that, whereas the, the atomic clock that looked more like a toaster, maybe people are a little bit less familiar with. But honestly, the kinds of systems that we use for determining position and time right now are all based on things like the atomic clocks, where it's a little bit less familiar to people. Uh, and it is true that people do often wonder uh, about the reliability of these systems. It's not so much a question of moving from analog to digital. Those are just two different ways of representing the same thing. Uh, in fact, I'm sure a lot of you out there, either on your computer or your mobile devices, have probably set them to look at an, to display an analog clock face. So you look at the analog clock face on the screen right now. Remember we said this was a transmitting clock? That analog clock face is just a way of transmitting the time locally. It's actually not how it transmitted the time. It was actually uh, electrical and mechanical guts in there um, so we've already been relying on, I don't know if you want to define it digitally, but uh, it, it's already, it's been electronic for, for quite some time. But the reliability of the system is, is, a, is actually a great question. It'll come up again uh, at the, in the 2 o'clock session today. There are right now thousands and thousands of clever engineers and other people trying to make sure that systems like GPS and the other worldwide systems are even more robust than they are now. Um, you, if you've paying attention to the news, there was actually um, a, a, an, a, an outage for the Russian version of satellite navigation, a system called GLONASS, which was happened maybe two weeks ago, uh, roughly. It was at, at the whole system went down. They, they um, for a brief period, they actually traced it back to a software problem. Uh, so this is a legitimate question that people ask. Uh, it, GPS and other systems are terribly robust, but there are investments going on right now uh, to make sure that they'll continue to operate more in the future. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Now, earlier you touched on how the railroads were actually responsible for standardizing the time zones in the U.S. That seems like such a no-brainer, but was was there actually a long period of time where people were wrestling with, you know, what do we do with this, um, and why didn't the government step in? Were there people resisting this? Well, I think the reason the railroads took the lead is because this was the first time you had um, – uh, unified systems that had to operate over large expanses of longitude. Let's put it that way, um, where you had national governments and other and, and private entities uh, sending ships all over the world. So you had thousands of ships crossing the ocean, but those ships didn't move fast enough to experience what we now call jet lag. You know, for for lack of a better term. Uh, so uh, it was the systems worked okay, relying on local time. When you arrived in that city. You would observe where the local observatory said it was noon, uh, and people have maybe seen pictures of observatories that used to have the ball that was dropping. That's where the New Year's uh, ritual comes from, that the local observatory would have a ball on a pole that would drop at local solar noon. And the reason they had that pole up there was so that ships in the harbor could see it. So that so that somebody in a ship in a harbor could say, right, this is local noon, and then I'm in you know whatever city I'm in. But fast forward to the railroads. We're now you know going into the, the uh, 1850s, 1860s. You have this period where trains do go fast enough to experience, well, we won't call it jet lag, but we'll call it train lag, I suppose. Um, if you're going from east to west or west to east, you actually have to set your clock depending on what stop you're in, and there may be stops separated by only 30, 40 minutes. There were train timetables published where um, you the stops every time a train would depart or arrive, it would it would be marked in local time. And then you'd consult a separate piece of paper which would say that this city is 10 minutes before is is 10 minutes ahead of this other city, and this this next city down the road is maybe 12 minutes behind this other city. And it got terribly complicated. And the people running the railroads needed to come up with a solution. So that's why they they came up with this idea of standard uh, the, the railroad standard time as as Michaeline was describing it. It was the speed with which they moved that I think was was the key to driving them to agreeing to this standard time. But also, when you're thinking about the development of our country and when the railroads were finally developed, it wasn't until after we finally got railroads going all the way across our country where it was that really became all those complications that Andy's talking about really became an issue and that they really they realized that as a larger entity that the railroads were going to have to tell time when it when your trains weren't going that far and they weren't connecting across the country it wasn't as big a deal that's wonderful thank you i had no idea there was such a elaborate history behind it it's very cool to to hear in detail that these things that we take for granted especially as we uh, take flights especially uh that that there was such a history with them and i love train lag that's a, a new term for me as well. I just made that up. Feel free to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. Well, wonderful. We'll continue to hold for a little bit to see if we have any other questions coming in from our participants. I'll just pull up the schedule for the rest of the day so we can take another peek at that. And we do remind you that uh, even if we wrap up the session for this morning a little bit early, we have three more sessions taking place throughout the day. You can find out more details on the conference website, but here's a list of those on the screen. Also, if today is your last session, or if this is your last session with us today, we do hope that you'll take a quick moment to click on the evaluation button in the top left-hand corner of the screen. But if you're planning to stick with us, which we hope you are, then you can wait to click on that button until the very end of the day or until your last session. We'll just hold for another minute or two and see if we have any other questions. And I see one popping in right now that we'll uh, take a quick look at. How does the chronometer uh, that the British use work? Hmm. Uh, perhaps this might be referring. I'm not sure what this. Oh, here we go. Uh, oh, that solved the longitude problem. Yes. So this is this is referring to I I think Harrison's chronometers. Um, I, this is actually an, inter an interesting part of the question of determining longitude using time. Uh, again, if we go back in time 300 years, as Michaeline was describing earlier, we didn't really have a way of determining time uh, at at sea very well. There are a few ways that you could do it. You could use uh, the Earth as a clock, but that wouldn't work if you were at sea because as you were moving, the sun would be in a different position, you know, at your local uh, noon. Uh, you could use the moon as a clock. 
the moon actually moves uh, fast enough against the background of stars that you can use it to determine time good enough to determine your longitude. The problem was, 300 years ago, we didn't have accurate enough charts uh, or accurate enough uh, observation instruments to determine the precise location of the moon in the sky. There was a, something called the lunar distance method. But another way of solving a problem was with mechanical timepieces. If you could carry a clock with you and set it so that it kept time precise enough and it matched, say, your home port, you could determine longitude. The problem was, centuries ago, clocks, even some clocks on land, were gaining and losing 10, 15 minutes a day, which made them useless for determining longitude uh, or position. Uh, the first guy to make a, a, a practical device that could measure time precisely enough for, for measuring longitude uh, was a guy named Harrison. He's an Englishman, um, and he, he, he uh, built a, a series of clocks uh, some of which are still on display actually at the Greenwich Observatory uh, j just outside London. Not only are they still on display, some of them are still running and still keeping decent time. It's, it's, really, it's really pretty incredible. How they worked, uh, they, were, they had a lot of uh, commonalities with uh, the marine chronometers that you saw on the screen earlier. They, uh, the power was, presided, uh, was provided by, by springs, and you had things, you had to replace the pendulum. A pendulum would not work at sea because the ship was moving back and forth. So Harrison designed these uh, spring-loaded, uh, uh, counter-weighted arms that would swing in and out. And, the, and he had two of them. The idea was that this would not be as sensitive to the rocking of the boat. Uh, the other thing that Harrison had to keep uh, in, take into account was thermal activity. If, as the temperature would go up and down, that would change the speed at which a clock ticked because the metal of the clock would expand and contract. So he devised solutions to all these things, tested it many times, and his first clock uh, worked well enough to determine longitude. And then subsequently his clocks got even more advanced because they got smaller and easier to carry. After he was done making clocks, other clockmakers came along and copied his design. And then eventually these were deployed uh, on, on ships crossing the ocean. But it took many decades for his designs to be refined so that they were small and portable enough so they were widely deployed first on British ships but then uh, other, other ships as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Hey, I see a question that came in here from Len and it actually touches on something that we talked about a little earlier. What did they have uh, for area time before time zones were established? And I, I know you mentioned specific towns. Did states also do it? Were, did towns decide amongst themselves, or was it really just up to that individual town and location? Yeah, it was towns. Yeah, because remember, even even on a state, uh, remember what was said, the, the, the sun actually moves over 15 degrees over one hour. Um, so there are some states in the U.S. that actually cover a decent you know, fraction of that. So you couldn't have, I don't know, Pennsylvania state time because uh, the, the time in... Uh, the sun's position will be different in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, just to take that one you know, for example. So it really made the most sense for, for each time uh, to be based on the city. And locally, you would either have, uh, in small towns, you would have individual observers doing it. In the large towns, like we keep mentioning Greenwich, but then also the Naval Observatory here in Washington, D.C., um, I mentioned before about the observatory with the ball that would drop. That would be the official timekeeper for that city. And it was based on the location of the, uh, the location of the sun in the sky at the location of that observatory. If you go to Greenwich, even if you go to the old Naval Observatory here in D.C., the sun's noon position was based on where the telescope was built. They would put the telescope on the ground. They would observe where the sun was directly at the highest point in the sky. They'd draw a line on the ground, and they would just make an arbitrary decision. This is what it's based on. And that's where things like prime meridians come from. So no, it wasn't. It wasn't so much areas before standardized. It was really based on local time in each city. Well, I, I think as you describe that, I can see why there might have been some resistance to people not wanting to give up their their tradition or their 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 habits, <laughs> as it may be. Yes, because the 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 choosing a certain meridian, is, the Earth is roughly spherical. We know now it's not perfectly spherical, but but it's it's roughly spherical. Um, you could make any longitude system work with almost any, you know, prime meridian. Uh, uh, but yes, it's not just technical requirements. It's also tradition uh, and politics and, and all the rest. Yep. And when you discussed the, the meeting to decide what the prime meridian would be, interesting that you had the French holding out for Paris. So a lot of people thought it should be uh, Greenwich because of the, the history there with the, the, um, the, the shipping. Yeah. Uh, but then the meeting was held in D.C., so where was the home turf advantage? There was 
It was uh, <laughs> no shift there. Well, it, it, even American sailors were largely using charts based on on the Greenwich meridian. So I think mm. I think that had a big role there. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. This wasn't it seventy percent of the so yeah. seventy two percent of the charts were based on using yeah. Greenwich as the prime meridian. Yeah, yeah, that, that's about right. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds like it was just a decision that made the most sense. Right. Though I, I can imagine a few people that would have made quite a bit of money off of having to shift those 70% off to a new one. So there I, you go. I don't know if there were lobbyists at the time that were working in the same way that we have in modern politics, but uh, you could see people pushing some different interests there. The, the other interesting thing about global politics that you mentioned is that it was the, it was the global standard was standard on, it was decided on this meeting. But not every nation in the world was there, of course. You know, it's just the nations that were active in in sort of global seagoing navigation. You know, but uh, but like I said, it's now become a standard, so everybody's on board for better or worse. <laughs> a global meeting where half the people get the memo after the meeting is done. Right. <laughs> That's great. I love Len's comment that popped in here in the chat. In colonial days, it must have been hard to have a 9 a.m. meeting. <laughs> I think so. It's not something that we usually think about when we think of early governance and. Uh, the origin of our country before standard time before reliable mechanical timepieces the way people thought about time must have been very different right you if you were 10 minutes there was no such thing as being 10 minutes late to a meeting right it was uh, uh, unless you were in the same room together right. I suppose <laughs> <laughs> that must be nice though then there was no stress of texting saying you're 10 minutes late of course there was no way to text but <laughs> different levels have been added on since right. then right well, wonderful. I, it looks like we've reached the end of the questions submitted by our participants for this session. So we'll wrap up a little bit early, but we do want to remind all of you that we'll be back with you in just about 18 minutes with Meeting the Challenge, Inventing the Future. And we hope that you'll rejoin us for that next session. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mike Lean, and thank you, Andrew, for taking the time to talk with us today. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks. Great. And Andrew, we'll be hearing from you again a little later today. So we'll see you back.